Come with me to a certain town in a certain place in which people live and conduct business. And in this town there is a main street and some small office buildings. Small because the town itself is of modest size. If you go inside of this small office building, you'd go down the hall and you would come to one office which has the name on it. And that name is Ed Wilson, D.D. It is now midnight. And at midnight, Ed Wilson comes out of his office, goes out of the building, crosses the street, being a small town, there are houses right there across the street. And Ed Wilson begins to practice his profession. He goes to work at midnight. And what he does is go up to a home, see him walking up to a home, walking up the walkway, he goes up the steps and goes up to the door. And when he reaches the door, he makes a racket. He pounds on the door and he hollers and he screams for about one minute, and then he goes away. Walks back down the walkway, walks down the sidewalk again, goes past a dozen or so houses, goes up to another house, walks up to the door, pounds and hollers at, enough to be heard inside. About a minute later, after hollering and screaming, he comes back in, and he starts wandering all over town at certain selected houses. He goes up and pounds on the door and yells out. This goes on for several hours. Now, shift your mind to another scene while Ed Wilson goes about, Ed Wilson, D.D., goes about his work. Here's an all-night cafe in town. It's now about 2 o'clock in the morning. And a businessman driving through, does a lot of traveling around the country. He stops at the all-night cafe and stretches a little bit as he gets out the car and tends to go inside for a little snack before he continues his trip. As he gets out of his car and gets on the sidewalk, he looks around a little bit and stretches and relaxes a minute. And he looks across the street and he sees Ed Wilson, D.D., performing his services. And the businessman looks and wonders at what he sees. There's Ed going up to a house, pounding on the door, making a racket. Going away, going down to another house, making a racket. So the businessman goes inside the cafe and orders a little something, enjoys his snack, but the scene he has just seen haunts his mind. He can't get it out of his mind. He goes, what's going on? What kind of a town is this? So he asks the waitress, he says, uh, Miss, excuse me, but I just saw an incredible scene a minute ago. I wonder if you could put me at ease about it. Could you explain what's going on? I saw a man walking up the different doors, pounding and yelling, and then going away and going the next door on and on. I must have saw him just in the last five minutes go to half a dozen doors and do that. And the waitress said, oh, oh, sure. That's Ed Wilson, D.D. That's his business. And the salesman said, I thank you for telling me that, but could you go into a little bit of details on it? I've never seen such a service as this in my life. And she says, well, it is very rare. If I tell you what DD stands for, you may begin to understand. DD stands for Dream Disturber. And what Ed Wilson does is this. See, there are a lot of people in this town, a certain number of people, who have bad dreams. They have nightmares. And they don't like their nightmares. So they hire Ed Wilson to come down, starting at midnight, and put an awful racket on the door to wake them up a little bit. So they don't suffer from their own nightmares. He's a dream disturber. And it became clear to the businessman. But he, he said, um, well, how come he doesn't do that to everyone? I noticed that he only selects certain houses. And she said, well, that's very simple, too. Only the people who request his services can have it. 
If Ed Wilson went around pounding on everyone's door, they'd scream out, go away and let me sleep, right? So only those who request disturbance, disturbing their dreams, get the service. And the businessman understood, and now do you understand? What are these classes all about but to disturb your dreams? Now you have to do some work in it too, don't you? You have to subscribe to the services. And you, you have to respond when that truth comes knocking on your door to say, wake up man, woman, look what you're doing. You're, you're having a nightmare and taking the nightmare as your real life. Now you think about that. Here's where you come into it. I, I will tell you something. Your whole life is nothing but a bad dream, which you take as real because you think about it. You will, you will see this for yourself when you wake up. And you can catch glimpses of it when truth comes to you and, and shakes you awake and say, look, you're crying, you're in pain, that means you're having a bad dream. Let truth wake you up a little bit at a time at least. Because for the split second, when you hear the rattling and the noise on the door, the shouting, that split second that you're awake, you can see the difference between the dream and the awakened state. You can't see what, to, what it means to be awakened while you're asleep. How can you? All there is is sleep, the nightmare. Gradually, as you obey the yelling, the knocking on the door, the period of being awake comes longer and longer and longer. And with that, see, truth has a, a built-in appeal. When you get a little bit of it, a little sensing of it, there is, in proportion to the amount of it, an equal degree of your wish for more. So that there's something inside of you, and it, even in spite of the, the part that wants to stay in daydreams, that little part begins to work for you and give you the strength that you don't have of yourself. I don't know, I really don't know any word better to describe what we have to do than to yield. Now that's something you can do. You, you can't wake yourself up. What you can do is yield to the man pounding on the door, the dream disturber. Remember the other people in the story? They didn't want the services. They wanted, they wanted to dream on and on. Now, what is the disturbance of a dream? Let's see. It is the interruption of the mechanical flow of false desires, among other things. When you want something that you don't need, that is a part of the dream. And you're all excited over getting what you think you need for your life existence. And life out there, a person or an event, says no. Now that's an interruption, but that's not good enough. You have to wait. See, that's the pounding on the door, the disturbance of your dream, but you have to be willing to let yourself go, so to speak, to wake up in order to get the message out of it. People who don't subscribe to the services of truth can hear the knocking all right. They're denied what they want from life and they get mad. They say, go away and let me sleep. Let me dream on that someday I'm going to get what I want and then I'll be all right. It never comes, you know that. It never happens. So they dream on and on. So we have two things. The disturbance. We disturb a lot of people, don't we, when we go out to places down at libraries to give talks in Los Angeles. Don't we disturb a lot of people? All right, I don't see those people here today, and they may not be at the talks in Los Angeles, because they have been disturbed, but they say, go away and let me continue with my beautiful nightmare, because I always hope, listen to this stupidity, they hope 
that within the dream, the bad dream, within the nightmare will be the gratification of what they want. But if they get what they want, that is still part of the nightmare. You have a dream of, of a billion dollars, of security and having a family, a husband or wife, and even when you get that, it proves that it's still part of your nightmare because you're still not secure. Anything you get in a dream is a dream, right? How many people want to see that? Let me give you a sentence to write down in addition to this. All set. There, there are higher things to think about. There are higher things to think about. Yeah, when you're tempted to fall into blabbing, dreaming, wandering around inside of yourself, can't you catch yourself and become your own dream disturber and say, look, look where I was, uh, giddy. How about giddy? You know what it means to be giddy, dizzy. You're in a giddy, dizzy frame of mind. And that is a part of your nightmare, a part of your dream state. There are higher things to think about. See, when you're in a dizzy state, you are thinking, but it's pointless. There's no value in it. You catch yourself going around in circles inside your mind, you can say, there are higher things to think about. For example, why don't you stop yourself right in the middle of the false pleasure of your next daydream, oh, you're going to suffer. Have you ever experienced this? Have you ever experienced the agony of knowing what you have to do to disturb your own dream in order to wake up? How about, how about gentlemen, maybe ladies too, how about that sex thought? You know, you're glad no one knows you think those sex thoughts. You, you know, that pretty girl, gentlemen, I see you've been smiling, you know? All right, right in them. You, you spot her, huh, gentlemen? There she is walking down the street. Wow. Because you're not in control of yourself. You, you get taken away by her physical shape and her pretty hair and all that stuff. Right in the middle of it. Ah, no. Disturb the flow. There are higher things to do than to lose myself in thoughts about that pretty girl walking along there. Oh, the pain you're going to go through, huh? D, D, disturbing the dream. Do it! Over and over and over and over, and the longer you do it, uh, really, the longer you do it, the easier it becomes. That's after 10 years. <laughs> You have to find out for yourself where you are wasting your life in daydreams. Because everyone, we're all built a little different, right? Everyone has their own areas, specific areas, where you are sleeping, daydreaming, night dreaming, nightmaring, and not knowing it. And I'll tell you that they will all be connected with the past. They can't come from any place else but the past. Even if you think about the future, it's based on past thinking, which you've then modified and changed a little bit. You want to repeat in the future a certain success you've had in the past, or you want to avoid a danger in the future that you had in the past, a mistake or whatever. Go home sometime and write down on a piece of paper where you suspect you are enjoying the nightmare. Now I'll tell you, I'll tell you one that's characteristic of everyone. Being defeated. And can you think of, can you think of the horror of human beings who spend their lives dreaming about being defeated. You don't understand that, do you? you? You think people dream about being a success. No. 
They dream about being a success and they also dream about being a failure. It doesn't make ever, any difference which side the yes or no flops onto. Because being a failure, being defeated, is still you being defeated. You don't kid me. None of you here kid me when you tell me your problems. You don't kid me when you tell me how defeated you are, how badly the world treats you. You know how I see you? I see you as someone who loves the nightmare. Do you, th do you think I'm going to take your nightmare seriously? Do you think I'm going to sympathize with you? I am seeing you, not going along with you. You, you ought to be very grateful that your nightmare is not being confirmed. It can, it'll never be confirmed. Impossible. Well, it's about time you became a, say your own name, D.E.D. Write it down sometime. It'll help you to remember. Whatever your name is, D.D. One Corpus D.D. <laughs> Dream disturber. I saw, I'll give you an example in the world now. We've covered ourselves a little bit. Example out in the world. A magazine came to me the other day, and, and it was two photographs. It was a religious type magazine. And one of the photographs showed a man being given an award for religious services, so-called religious services. And in back of him were, was the audience, which was applauding as he got the award, distinguished religious service or something like that. And there he was, of course, he was foremost in the photograph, standing there getting the reward and applause and, the, and admiration in the background. The other photograph showed him being congratulated, hand shook by a, another famous preacher. He was a preacher, the man getting the reward, and the man congratulating him was an even more famous preacher, whose name you would all know, congratulating him. Got the picture so far? Got the two pictures so far? Do you think those two men, this man is known all over the world, well, both of them are known all over the world. Do you think those two men or any of the hundreds of people in the audience knew that the whole thing was a nightmare? Do you know what? No, you don't know it. The whole thing was a dream of intellects that are lost. The whole scene, everything that happened there, something physical was happening, we know that. People were moving around, a man was getting the reward. He was nodding modestly as people applauded him. Something physical was happening. But deluded minds had caused this physical happening, and that is what the nightmare was. Human beings who have no, by the way, these are all religious people. Religious people who have no goodness because when you're asleep, when you're in your nightmares and daymares, you can't be good. But you can sure dream that you are, can't you? All right, now here's the point, one of the points. Not one of those so-called religious people out of the hundreds knew the following. This is exact, exactly what true spiritual books and true spiritual teachers were talking about, about not getting your rewards from this world. The true teachers always say, don't get your awards and your praise from men. Don't stand out in the marketplace and be praised by other people. Now these people getting the awards and giving the awards were people who had read all about that thousands of times and they preached sermons about it. And there they were, not seeing it. You want to disturb their dream? I'll tell you what to do, only don't do it. <laughs> You go in there right after they'd given the 
plaque to the man, the certificate. And all the applause died down. And you stand up and say, ladies and gentlemen, I have something to tell you. My name is Bill Smith, D.D. <laughs> <laughs> I am now going to disturb your dreams. And I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, exactly what you're going to do. You see, I'm a prophet, too. <laughs> what you're going to do is get very hateful in a minute. I'm telling you, there's no way you can prevent it. No way at all. You're going to want to boot me out of here. And you people are so loaded with physical violence, you're already straining. I can see it in the way you lean forward. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what DD stands for. It stand, stands for Dream Disturber. And then you go into your... It can't happen, of course. <laughs> Then you go into explaining to them what I explained to you. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, you so-called religious people, you so-called children of God, who have so much hatred in you of God, already you're in danger, right? And then you explain to them, look, these religious books that you read, they tell you, you, you mustn't get honors from men. You mustn't stand up and be applauded and be shake hands and everybody gets their picture in the paper. Great. See, what you really want, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, why you're all doing this. There's a dream operating inside of every one of you. You're in a nightmare and you don't even know it. The reason you're doing this is because when you're in daydreams, you always must try to confirm yourself as being real. Everything, ladies and gentlemen, that went on in this room is done in a state of sleep, spiritual sleep. You don't know this, but if there's just one of you in this room who wants to know this, I'll tell you how you can start. You can do two things. As I tell you that you're all religious hypocrites, which you are, every one of you, and you're very cruel. Oh, you, no one more cruel than you religious hypocrites. I'll tell you what you can do. You can do two things. First of all, you can look out and see, see that there are no smiling faces in the room anymore as there was a few minutes ago when you were applauding the guest. You can see that people, people have changed dramatically in just the last few minutes. They, they had now have worried looks on their faces. They're solemn. And they're, even, they're physically tense. And each person will express this, this anger in a different way. You can begin to see that these people aren't religious at all. How can you be religious and be bad? These are bad people. All of a sudden, you have disturbed their dream. The other way still talking to the one or two who wants to wake up. The other way is seeing that the same thing is in you. Look, sir, madam, look how you're glaring at me right now. Look at your own eyes. If I held a mirror up in front of your face, how would you describe yourself? I don't have to tell you, there's no way this could ever happen. Right? But we're learning things, aren't we? So we come again to that very familiar word, unawareness. Let me give you a few details on that. A devil doesn't know he's a devil. Unawareness, right? A childish human being doesn't know he's a childish human being. A person who's concealing hatred in his heart under a front of being loving, he, she, doesn't know that he's a hypocrite. What do you do? One thing, well, one thing with yourself. You have to see that the disturbance of your dream can start with seeing the facts about what I just said, that you are divided, that you say one thing and you do another. 
You have to see that the disturbance of the dream happens when a reality is presented to you, but you have to accept it as the reality. The reality being that you were in a dream, but you can awaken. And all this, all these little parts and bits I'm putting out to come together on themselves like the jigsaw puzzle when you do it. What inside of you is asleep? And look at it right now. Now, because I am looking at you and I know that I am looking at people who are even listening to this talk in a state of sleep. That was a little knock on the door. I yelled a little bit. Will you listen to it and look back at your state and say, that's right. There was something in me that was not awake. I, I didn't hear the message of what you said. I heard the words. I heard the shouting. But did you let it shock you that for one second you were awake? And when you're awake, I'll guarantee you there'll be evidence of it. And the evidence of it is that you see that you were asleep a second ago. When you're awake, you know what sleep is. When you're asleep, you don't know what either sleep or awakeness is. When you begin to wake up, you know what both are because you can look back and see it. Truth is going around to the subscribers, if you're one, who have subscribed to the service. Truth is going on, pounding all the time. And when you get angry, when you break down, when you sob, when you run away in any way at all, you have refused the message. There's something in you that says, go away and let me slumber on. I prefer to dream my life away than live it. Now, you don't know the difference between dreaming your life away and living it. However, how happy to know that you're in a place where you can learn. The first thing you have to learn is the nature of the nightmare, which is what you carelessly choose. From now on, you will know, you will try to identify the nightmare state when it comes to you. And it's so easy. All you have to do is look and see that you are disturbed, upset, nervous, that all kinds of agitations are going on inside of you. If you're so nervous, you have to phone somebody. You have to blab to yourself. Ah, I understand. If I am disturbed, nervous, upset, distressed, I am asleep. Ah! That's paying attention to the dream disturber at the door. You're, you're seeing the condition you're in. And someday, some magic day, there'll be one second in which you'll say, ah! Now I begin to see the difference between a nightmare and reality. I, I thought the nightmare was reality, but now I've caught a glimpse. One second. You'll never be the same human being again. Isn't that nice? The artificial self must have a future in order to survive. Since it lives the artificial self lives in time, in thought, ordinary thinking. That is time itself. So it must always revolve around time, past or future. If you begin to rob the artificial self of time experiences, it will scream its objections, but in spite of all its objections, it must fade away. As it begins 
to fade away, you begin to see yourself, not think yourself, but begin to see yourself, know yourself, as a different kind of an entity than you knew yourself before. Because when you cease to recreate your invented personality through thinking, as you cease to recreate it, it begins to dissolve. The dissolution of time and the dissolution of the invented personality are the same thing. So gradually, more and more and more, you, your real nature, begins to rest in the here and now, no matter what you're doing, whether you're sweeping the floor or conducting business or driving your car or whatever, you begin to get a sense, a sensing that there is, really is, nothing but right now. And that is because that is where you are. But for a long time, the pull, the tug of time thoughts will try to pull you away from here and now, the timeless state, and it will succeed, won't it? You've had this experience where maybe you, you understand that this is all that counts. Is there's no past to feel ashamed of. There's no future to go to. There's nothing at all that time thought can create. This sensing becomes stronger and stronger as all the pieces are put together. Wouldn't it be nice to come home and rest? You're not at rest now, are you? You're not at home. You're not comfortable. Oh, you've got excitements. And you've got activities. And you have a mind that's racing in a dozen different directions at once. You have things going on, but did you hear the word I used? Rest. Let me tell you what you fear. You fear rest. You fear quietness. One of your greatest apprehensions would be to come to a place where there is silence, where there's no agitation at all. And by the way, this place exists. Not for you. Not the way you live. Not for what you have chosen for your way of life. When you start to talk to a human being about being free of himself, about slowing down and eventually stopping his mad mind, when you start to talk to human beings about that, they begin to get nervous, doubly nervous. Because you're beginning to ask them to do something they have never done before, which therefore they fear. Now, all of you here tonight have never known a moment's rest in your entire life. Oh, yes, you've sat at home and quietly read a book or watched television or gone someplace with a few friends and had a quiet evening. I'm not talking about that. Let's make it quite clear right at the very start what we are talking about. I'm talking about your internal world about your inner life, not that phony, fake life that you put on on the exterior, kidding yourself all day long, and kidding other people, and you never succeed even at that. And if you are even a little bit nervous or angry at what you've heard already, the point has been proven, which is this. When the truth, when the light starts to get close to a human being, he gets scared. He or she wants to run away, he wants to get up and actually walk out of the talk or disappear during the break, which some of you foolish people might do. You see, try to understand what I'm talking about. Come on, think a little bit for once in your life. 
you are so used to your agitation, to using, using anger, toward using sarcasm, toward using fear. You're so used to that, that when truth comes along and tells you, you don't have to wreck yourself anymore, it baffles you and frightens you. You wouldn't know what to do with rest. You wouldn't know what to do with peace of mind. How utterly tragic. How sad. Some of you here tonight have a chance. Some of you may be just at the point where you're sensing the truth that I'm telling you. That you know very well that I've described you. Don't you come to me and tell me what your religion has done for you. What it's done is made you into a religious hypocrite. Made you into a phony who has to defend yourself. If you know the truth, you don't have to defend anything. You don't have to attack. You don't have to scoff. You don't have to sneer. Oh, how beautiful of what we can do tonight. Do you know what you can do tonight that would be marvelous for you? Let me tell you what it is in the, in the simplest of terms. Admit that you have never known what your life is all about. That you don't know it here tonight. You don't know anything about anything regarding your inner life. All you know is how much money you're going to make. That raise that you're idiotically demanding. All those women you're going to pick up and all those men you're going to con. And all those marvelous expensive dinners you're going to have. For heaven's sake, wake up. What's it going to take to shock you out of your sleep? and see what you're doing, listen, what you're doing against yourself. Were you mad today? Were you jealous today? Were you scared today? Did you accuse someone today? And did you hide it all? Because at all costs, you think you must keep the front going. You must put on the actor's mask and the actor's costume and pretend that you know what you're doing. You don't. And I know it, and you know it. So look, we're off to a nice, marvelous start tonight with the honesty. The honesty that up to this point in your life, it's been lost. Don't you try to kid me. You've kidded yourself all your life. You didn't... You didn't come here tonight to kid me. I know you a million times better than you know yourself, and you should be very grateful for that. Because you see, if a person is physically sick and he doesn't know how to cure his headache or his tummy ache or whatever, if he doesn't know what to do about it, then it's a sign of intelligence to find a doctor, someone who knows about those things, to tell him how to cure himself. Now, would you call that, don't you uh, get help when you're physically wrong with him? Sure you do. You go find someone who knows more than you do, and you put yourself in his hands. Now, you're not putting yourself in my hands. It's the last thing that I ever permit you to do anyway. What you have to do is begin to put yourself in the hands of anything outside of you, and that anything outside of you is the one thing that can rescue you, and nothing else. You haven't found any rescue up until now. How soon is it going to be before you crack up? Before you go to the bottle? Or you go into some stupid business involvement just to make yourself think you're going somewhere? Or the next involvement with that equally stupid man or a woman? And that next man or woman that you get involved with is going to be stupid because like attracts like. And you're getting involved with him or her just to give yourself the belief that something exciting and worthwhile is happening. Tonight, all that comes to a halt. Let me tell you then, the supreme signs of, of a human being who is beginning, just beginning, who is beginning to become intelligent. Then I'm going to tell you the signs of a human being who is stupid. 
a man or a woman who is beginning, in all honesty to be right, is a man or a woman who always, consistently, as best he can at the start, puts both the problem and the solution inside himself. Both the problem and the solution inside himself. A stupid human being, now look, you judge yourself. I know you, but I don't judge you. I understand you perfectly. You have to judge yourself. I can't judge you. A stupid human being is one who always puts both the problem and the solution outside himself. How many complaints did you have today as to how rude other people were to you? Oh, your whole life. How many times do you lash out at the world? How people cut you out? How much more favored other people are than you? And you very pathetically said, I'm going to get mine. And even if you got it, you went home with a headache, didn't you? So we always put the problem outside of ourselves, and, and since we don't know anything about an inner life as yet, we put the solution out there. So you get involved in some stupid religion, a hypocritical religion, or philosophy, or you hide out at home with all your daydreams and your nightmares, and you read lots of books to keep yourself distracted, and you fill your head with knowledge, and it drives you crazy. Tonight, we will explore the beginning of spiritual, authentic, healthy inner intelligence. If you have a problem, who has the problem? If you have a problem, you have a problem. The problem, therefore, is inside of you. Take, li listen to this word. See how it comes close to home. See how crowded you feel in life. You know what exterior crowding is, don't you? We all had it as we drove here, probably, the crowded freeway and 10th in line at the supermarket. Life feels out there as if there's, there's just too many things going on, too much to cope with, too many bills to pay, too many forms to fill out, too many letters to answer, too, many, too much going on and it seemed to be crowding in and cramping and stifling our life. Ah, now look at the inner life. Have you ever noticed how crowded you feel in there? That, that even your own mind won't leave you alone. Your own feelings crash against each other. You have one strong impulse one minute that you're, you're very happy about something. Someone said something nice to you, you're invited to something, and the next minute you're crushed and depressed because someone says you look a little older than you did a year ago. It doesn't take much to set you off, does it? To make you depressed, to be heavy-spirited. So we feel crowded. That's one problem. Let's take another one. What do you want? What, what do you want in life? What, what do you get up in the morning for? What, what do you want out of life? You don't know, do you? Well, you know you want your paycheck, and that's all right. You have to buy bread and pay the rent. We understand that. And you like companionships. We're social people. We like to meet with other people. Maybe you like a boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, or whatever. We understand those things. We're not talking about that. Because you see, all these things of making a lot of money and making a lot of friends and having a, a home, having a household, having domestic activities, all that will come to an end. Do you understand? All that is in time. There's no eternity in it at all. You could be the head of one of these big big casinos around here, around the block down there. You could be the head of it. And what have you got? I'll tell you, you don't have a thing where you can turn to, as I open the talk with, you don't have a thing that you can turn to and know that you're at rest, you're at peace, because you understand, because you understand both life and death. You don't understand death because you don't understand life, by the way. If you understand one thoroughly, you'll understand the other. 
and you'll see how the mind creates them. And you see how the mind distorts them, which makes you af equally afraid of both of them. We're talking tonight about a true course in which you can begin to change everything. You can be, change the way you feel toward yourself, the way you feel toward other people in your life. And would you like some marvelous news? This is all marvelous news, you know, because it's the truth, it's the fact. If you would indeed begin to investigate inwardly to see how you're crowded, how you don't know what you want, simply to see that. If you were to do that, and begin to change yourself inwardly, uplift your thinking, and there's no way to explain the marvels of it, but you can know it for yourself. You would automatically, all by itself, see things change outside. How, how many traps are you in? How many people have got you in their net, and you'd like to get out of the net, and you don't know how? And you feel guilty of even thinking about it? And you're angry and oppressed and suppressed? I will tell you, if you will learn how to become a right man, a right woman, that exterior situation will fall apart and you'll walk free. This is not talk. This is a fact. The question is, are you going to work diligently to prove that it's a fact to you personally? What good does it do you to come to a talk like this and walk out and say, well, it's okay talk. It's all right but you've walked out of here the same kind of a person you were when you came in here. Therefore, tomorrow and the next day and the next week and month and the next year, you're going to still be depressed. You're, you're st still going to be afraid of yourself. Can you think of anything worse than a human being being afraid of living with himself? And you are every one of you in this room. You know that. Look, please. There happens to be an intelligence that is higher than yours that can see through you. That doesn't excite you? Or, or does it frighten you? That there is a God outside of your own self-glorification. Aren't you delighted to hear that there's something, someone, more intelligent than you, and therefore that someone or something can tell you how to heal yourself? Aren't you pleased? No, you're not. Because you want, you want to be your own God. You want your own mind with all it. You want to worship your own mad mind. Now how is that for authentic stupidity? See how positive all this is. You're given a chance to stop lying to yourself. To stop kidding yourself. Uh, the few of you who want something higher than yourself will begin to understand and will begin to absorb. And that, what you absorb will begin to change you. You can't change yourself the way you are now. All you can do is move from one end of, end of the swamp to the other, struggle toward one end, and when you get to the opposite end, you say, I have a new life, because you have a new set of follies, a new set of delusions in your mind. This is what millions of human beings do when they're told how to change themselves. They say, all right, I'll move to another town. I'll get a new wife, get a new religion, go to a new church, read new books. And the, the same scared, despairing person finds himself in that new city and reading those new books and getting involved with those new people. Let me tell you a story. There was a mountain village with several hundred people in it, and they lived what you call normal lives, which is abnormal. What you call a normal life in this world is purely abnormal. Crime and hatred and heartache, which you are all involved in, inwardly at least. And these people lived what was called normal lives, but all of a sudden one day they all went crazy. it was noticed that they all began to get agitated and nervous and hostile and aggressive. And what they did with all this build-up nervous energy was to declare war on another village on the other side of the mountain. And they got their spears and their swords and their arrows and 
started to attack the other country. And of course, they got wounded. When you attack, you get wounded. The very fact that you attack, the attack is the wound. And don't you ever forget that. You never get away with it, ladies and gentlemen. You attack someone today in your mind? Guess, guess who you attacked first? Yourself. The very fact that you have burning hatred in you, violence, which you lie about, of course. The very fact that you have that in you is the attack on yourself, and that is another sign of supreme stupidity. Can you imagine anyone, any human being being so dumb that they do bad things against themselves? You wouldn't let another person attack you, but you attack yourself and you don't know what's going on. Well, anyway, in this city, an outsider came and noticed what had happened, that all of a sudden these people were getting aggressive outwardly, physically, and attacking other people. And of course, now listen, and, and you tell me whether I'm describing the world that you live in exactly, and I am. So this outsider came and he asked all these people, what's going on here? You're living in moderate peace, at least you just quarrel among yourselves. All of a sudden, you declared war on another village, and you got wounded, and you wounded them, and you gave each other medals. The more a soldier wounded the enemy, the more medals he got, the more he was honored and given promotions. The more damage you did, the more he was honored in this world, huh? How come? What's happening? And so all the people, both men and women, by the way, who were warriors and attacking the other people, they all told this outsider why they did it. And here's what they said. They said, well, they, they attack us first, in their minds at least, so we had to defend ourselves. And they're stealing our farm products from our orchards and from our farms. They're seeding our fruits and vegetables. We had to attack them in order to prevent them from hurting us. It was necessary. It's justified to attack other people. Look what they were doing to us. The outsider, being an intelligent man, knew that they were lying and lying and lying and lying, as all hostile and violent people do. Hostility and violence go together. And by the way, you can be very violent and smile. And you cover it up, what's going on inside of you. So this man, he said, see, these people, are, they can't do anything but tell, tell gigantic lies about why they're behaving the way they do, which is what you do, by the way. You do all these vicious things to other people and to yourself equal, and then you lie about it because you have self-images that you're a nice person, a religious person, a spiritual person a person who understands life, and that's another lie on top of the other dozen lies. So he looked around to see if he could find the real cause of it, and he did. He found a cave that was right opposite the village, and he went inside this cave, and he saw one of their own, one of the other citizens, a man who was a scientist, who understood certain psychological and scientific facts. And what this scientist, this mad scientist was doing, he'd invented a certain machine that sent out subconscious messages, suggestions to the minds of the villagers. And he sent out messages of violence, of lies about their identity, about what other people were doing. Gigantic hypocrisy so that the people didn't know that they were receiving them. And why was this man doing this? for the same reason that mad people do anything at all in order to get power, in order to get authority, in order to get money, in order to get a bigger paycheck, in order to get a longer pension at the taxpayer's expense, on and on and on. He wanted to drive them mad because when you can drive people mad, you can control them better. You can put them under your power. And you know what he did? He explained it to the people, what was going on. And you know what they did? They drove the outsider out of town. They didn't want to hear it. And so they all destroyed each other. And I have described this society. My question to you tonight is this. Do you want to stop being a part of the insanity? It is possible. Do you recognize the fact that you are presently caught up in it? You've been a part of it. I have been a part of it since we were all little kids. 
those subconscious lies, misdirections, inciting you to madness, they started coming out of that very, very dark cave when you were a little child. And I'm telling you about it tonight so you'll recognize what happened to you. What happened to the rest of this world? And remember what I said when the outsider told the people what had happened? They became very angry. There it was, listen to this, it was too late for them. They had become so hardened in their negativity, in their falsehoods, in their hypocrisies, in their love for violence while justifying it, in their love for lies while justifying it. They become so hardened that the truth, the facts, could no longer get through. Are you at the point where you can still begin to hear? You keep going on the way you're going and it's going to be too late for you and nobody. The truth will never be able to get through with you and you're going to get harder and you're going to get scareder and you're going to continue to associate with your sick friends and you're all going to fall into the swamp together. Well, it happened today to you. It happened today to the whole world. What do you think the world did with itself today? But thrash around in the swamp. Thrashing around in the swamp, calling it a marvelous new business venture in which we're all going to make a lot of money. Calling it a marvelous new human relationship, marriage or friendship or sex affair. A marvelous new relationship in which we're all going to be happy at last. They're not. Tomorrow morning when the world wakes up, it's going to be just as depressed and just as hateful as it was before. Those of you who are in this room tonight who haven't walked out yet, those of you who don't disappear during the break, as some of you have already decided to do probably, those of you who have heard the message tonight and come back, it won't be too late. You, you, you reject what you've heard tonight, which is the pure truth, and I'll tell you what's going to happen to you. No, I'll, I'll explain it to you rather than tell you. You'll continue to experience more and more and more of yourself. Now, can you think of anything more dreadful than you continuing to live with yourself for the rest of this life? Ah, I know you. You still think it's outside. You don't think it's you at all. You think you're nice. You think you're innocent. You think you're intelligent. You're not intelligent at all and you're not nice at all. You've deceived yourself. But, but if you stick with it, you've got a chance to be a really decent human being. You know what a decent human being is? Same thing as an intelligent human being. A human being who no longer whips himself all day long. Well, how many false, wrong emotions did you whip yourself with today? Come on, name a few of them to yourself. You know, right, while I'm talking, you can be thinking of them. What, what were they? About a dozen irritations, feeling cheated, being afraid of how many people and how many events. Why don't you learn how to toss out the whole junk pile? Which you can do. If you will arouse yourself and say and shout, this is as far as I'm going in my own insanity. You say that and you are truly beginning to be intelligent because you recognize where the problem really is. And you say to that sick world out there, you go ahead and do anything you want with your pretense of knowing how to govern people, of how to live, with all your mad financial schemes and your lies about security. You can have it. As for me, I'm going to listen to something higher than social leaders. I'm going to listen to something far more noble than my own mad mind. I'm going to try to find out what is beneath the trash pile called my present psychic system. I'll tell you what's beneath it. Light that has been trying to break through for all your life. 
light that's been trying to break through to show you what you're really like, then to guide your footsteps for the rest of your life. Every one of you seated here tonight, you know in your heart of hearts that every single word you've heard is true. You know I've described you perfectly. Now it's your turn to act. I've acted in giving you facts. Now it's your turn, and it's your turn to choose. Don't be afraid. Have no fear at all of choosing the truth, of saying to yourself something like this, I'm going to go further into this, deeper into this. I, even if you're afraid, you can do it, and you will be afraid. I told you that earlier. Even if you're afraid to face the facts, even if you're afraid to be horrified at the exposure of this sick world, both inner and outer, even if you're afraid, do it anyway. <clears throat> you will finally come out all right. Finally, after a long, long time, you'll, you'll see something that you, you can't understand now, but here's what you'll understand, that there really is a God. There really is a power. There really is something higher than you that is stronger than the whole madness of this whole world put together. And you know it's mad. You know it's mad because you are terrified by it. And you don't know what to do. You're learning what to do tonight. Make tonight your first step. Your first step into something that is absolutely marvelous. So you'll never, never, never cringe again. You'll have a power that's a nut that doesn't come from your own mind or from your own determination, but that simply comes as a gift because you've received it. The invitation is out, ladies and gentlemen. Take it and see how it changes you. In spite of every opposition that you have or the world itself has, nothing, nothing in this mad world stands a chance against the light of truth. It is all powerful, but you have to do one thing. You have to receive it. You have to welcome it. Do your part and truth will do the rest. Anything you can learn about yourself is valuable in escaping yourself. Anything you can see in yourself where, where you can see a little bit of where you're hiding out, where you're fearful, where you're afraid of getting trapped by truth, all this is valuable. We're here to take the trash off the trap. I'll change that. We're here to take the roses off of the trap. You see, all traps are covered with a beautiful wreath of roses. And you think that you're going to a nice, pretty place and you get trapped. We're here to get all those phony roses off and just see the trap. Now, here's my comment in connection with that. With the exception of two or three of you, every single one of the new people here for the first time tonight are seated in the last half of the auditorium, the far half. Do you see any significance in that? Well, let me tell you that there is. You see, the more afraid we are of truth, the more we hide out physically. There are maybe 100 people here all together tonight. Now, what's the population of Las Vegas? 160,000, something like that. There are an awful lot of people who didn't come here tonight. What I'm saying is, did you notice, those of you who are here for the first time, that you did sit in the last half of the auditorium a, a bit away? You feel a little safer back there. You don't feel quite so much under attack. Why don't you sit in the front row so you can get more of it? You've got it exactly backward, and you don't see it. One lady was right here, now she's in the back row. The rest of you, after the talk, tend to stay in back. Wake up! Look what you're doing in the simplest of things. We'll show you how to invite something that is wiser than your self-destruction, that is wiser than your stupidity, because you don't know you're stupid. That's what stupidity is, unawareness of stupidity. Do you understand that? Intelligence is to begin to see how you don't know anything at all. You don't even know that you chose to sit in the far half so you'd feel safer. Why don't you be in front so you deliberately feel unsafe and see what happens to you? 
When are you going to stop hiding out? Tonight's talk was very mild. Wait till you get to the tough stuff. Then, then you will begin to be healed. Isn't that nice? Life that right values. Right well, look, you don't have any, so you can't find them. You don't have any right values at all. All you have, listen to this, all you have is egotism. Egotism gets bored with the truth. Egotism despises anything that is unlike itself. Egotism is afraid of its death at the hands of truth. It's afraid that there's another God in this universe besides itself. So here we have four million egotists on earth, each one of them saying, I know what is right, I know the truth, and you don't, and they kill each other. In the name of God and reality, four billion egotists kill each other. It's been going on for a long, long time, right? Now, here's what I want to ask all of you to do. Look at your state. Now listen. Oh, everyone. Look at your state right now, right now, and describe it to yourself. Don't lie. Don't lie. Describe your exact state right now. What is it? Now, if you are negative, if you are negative, can anything negative be right? Can anything negative be positive? Can anything negative, look, I'm talking about you. Can anything wrong be right for you? See, I know you. Any question, I might as well tell you right now, any question you ask here tonight, I have heard a thousand times before. There's no such thing as you asking an original question. I've heard them all before. As a matter of fact, we have a long list of them that we once wrote out in a little story called The Brain Donkey. Like, a, like to hear a few of them? No, I'll let you people do some work. You people from Boulder City. Give me some of the brays, some of the objections that people always say when they come to a, a lecture where the pure truth is said. The gentleman. Why don't you talk about love and brotherhood? Yeah, that's always the first. What are your credentials? Huh? What are your credentials? Yeah, what are my credentials? Of the lady in pink. I already know it all. Louder. I already know it all. I already know everything you're talking about. Yeah, give me something profound. I've known this for years. This is for everybody else. I don't need it. Yeah. You're talking like the devil. If you're so religious, where's your Bible? Where's what? Where's your Bible? My Bible. <laughs> this is just another one of them cults. Yeah, let me add one for the rest of you. Forget it. What do you do with all the money you make? Yeah. Let me tell you, I drive a Volkswagen. You can hardly afford that. <laughs> the gentleman back there. You said before that the intellect can't save us. Why is it so difficult to see that, that I'm trying to make the intellect save me? Well, the intellect is a god unto itself. What happens that a person comes to this world and he gets uh, all kinds of experiences, good or bad, uh, successes or failures, and all these thousands of experience become him, he thinks. It's not him at all. It's not his identity. It's his stack of ideas, which he calls him. But he worships that because it's the only thing he knows, and such a person is an atheist, an absolute atheist, because he worships his collection of mere memories about himself and not God. The only way you'll ever know God is when you disappear. And by the way, this is what Christ taught a long, long time ago. Of the gentleman. In your book, Esoteric Mind Power, it gives a, a clear description of what a man has to do to be, get out of the jungle, that is, see himself the way he actually is. The question is,
why is it so difficult for people to see themselves the way they are? Oh, it's, I'll tell you what it is. You listen to this. The reason most people don't ever make it, the most, most people die in their sins, as Guinness Christ said, is because they fear death. Now, let me explain that very carefully, and you listen carefully. Anyone who fights what you've heard here tonight, which, again, is the pure truth, is afraid of death. Now, they're afraid of the death of their false self, which they take as life. They're afraid that this collection of mere memories about themselves is going to be extinguished by truth, which is what has to happen if you're ever going to have eternal life instead of the time life you have right now. Any one of you here who feels afraid of what you've heard here tonight, I want you to know that essentially, deep down, that is a false fear. It has no real existence in itself. But you've made a great mistake. You have taken your egotism as being your identity. And no wonder you fight. I understand that. Look, I've been doing this a long time, and I know how much hostility always is brought out in a talk like that. Don't you think I know it? I, here I insulted you straight for a half hour. What do you think you're going to do? <laughs> See, I know that. And I know the question. I know all the hostile, angry questions. And I know, now listen to this. Any of you, which is practically all of you to one degree other, any one of you who fights, who is hostile, or asks hostile questions, I know what agony you're in. Have you ever noticed yourself when you're mad? When you're antagonistic? When you're hateful? Have you ever noticed your state? Don't you notice you're tense and you're arguing? You have a hard, neurotic look on your face? Well, have you noticed in other people? I know why you suffer. Because you have enthroned your sickness your egotism, which you call God. And you're afraid that God, the real God, is going to take your false God away from you. I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars for the whole universe. See, you're, explain once more. You're afraid of death, but you're afraid of the death of something that is false. Die to it! If a seed falls in the ground and dies, Christ said, only then can it bring forth fruit, whatever the thing was. The stages, the stages are to understand that you're living in death, which is living from your false identity made of experiences. Understanding that you're living in death, to die to death, to die to that death, which you call life and which you argue like. And I see the fire in your eyes. Look, I know a hostile person ten miles off. I've seen this a thousand times, and I know that person is scared. Do you think you don't take my life away from me? You have no life, you have death. You know, let me tell you something. We had a talk here about a year ago, and, and on two different occasions, we had two very hostile, hateful people in the room. One of them was a successful man, businessman or something. They're not here tonight, and let me tell you why. They both died, and they died without the truth. They sat right where you're sitting, and they argued, and they fought, and they died. I'm not making any connection with them being here in their death. I'm simply pointing out that, that they had a chance, and they refused it. You had, you had better be terrified if you're rejecting what you hear here tonight, if you want to fight truth. If you're a truth hater, I don't blame you for being terrified. And I know you are. Okay, let's go on. we got time. The lady. The, the inner space will open for you, and you can just walk through this sick world without noticing it. You know, you ignore it. You ignore the world out of existence. Right now, you pay attention to it because you want something from it. You want, you want to feed your sickness from this sick world, this gentleman. What are all these voices I hear in my head when I'm trying to go to sleep at night? Oh, just the general baddiness of your mind, which truth will take away. Look! How many of you have batty minds? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. Don't lie about it. Your minds are as batty as a Carlsbad Caverns.
the gentleman here. Why is it that when people condemn what is true and what is beautiful, that they always need an ally? Well, it's always true, because see, cowards can never stand alone as a truthful person can. When you get truth in you, you don't care about the rest of the world, but cowards must have other cowards around them. And they look at each other and they nod and smile. I've seen this a million. So have you. They look at you, they nod. And when they go out, they go out somewhere and have a drink together and, and criticize what they've heard here. And then when they separate and go home, they go home to hell. Because they, they go home with themselves. Look, there's nothing that a nut or a neurotic ever does in these classes that we haven't seen a million times before. Neurosis is never original, never. The gentleman. You have said that we're sick, that we're naughty, we're lost. Yeah. How come we can't you know, see this? We just can't see it. Well, I've explained it thoroughly because you take your present life as being real life. You take all your greed for money and your ego victories of trying to get ego victories. You take that as life. I'm telling you that it's death. You listen to me. You listen to what I'm telling you instead of what your sick mind is telling you and you'll inherit eternal life instead of the time life which you now have. The lady there, please. Does that mean I have to unlearn everything? An excellent word. Unlearn, yes indeed. Unlearn all the trash that your parents gave you and all your sick relatives gave you. Unlearn it. Toss it out. The lady, uh, when you said everybody who moves toward the back, there's a reason for it. They want to stay away from truth. She took that as an accusation personally. And she really had another reason for being in the back. And her mind is confused because of it. How would truth deal with that problem in her mind? Oh, that's simple. You judge in your own mind why, why you move back there. Maybe for some reason you want to be more physically comfortable, then you can ignore what I said. If it isn't true of you, then ignore it. If it was true, then take it as a lesson. No accusations. I present the facts to you. I never accuse anyone. I know you too well for that. I see you. I don't accuse you. We'll take two or three more. What kind of habits? Any kind of habits? Well, your habits are part of your intellectual machinery that gets in the habit of going in a certain way all the time, and you fall in love with that way of life, or not just smoking or drinking, but the way you think, the way you react, things like that, the way you handle women or don't handle women, whatever. And you take that as being right simply because it is familiar. And truth comes along and says, you're doing things all wrong. The mechanical parts that love to go in a certain direction begin to get disturbed because they want to keep in control of your life. And they don't want to hear this because they want to keep you under their tyranny. Well, let me ask uh, you a question. You could just answer to yourself. And again, this is to all of you. Are you authentically happy or are you simply pretending that you are? Are you really right inwardly, or do you have to argue and convince yourself that you are? If you have to convince yourself that you're right, you're wrong, and you'd better have the decency and the honesty admit it for your sake, not for mine. I don't care about you. The lady, please. I seem to be having a lot of confusion about making correct choices. She says she seems to be having a lot of confusion about making correct choices. Correct choices, yes. This is because right now, since you don't really understand yourself and you're not living with your true nature, you look out into the world and you see thousands of choices, don't you? People to associate with or not, whether to buy this furniture or not. Thousand choices, all right? Now, because you're still living from an ego self, all your choices are controlled by the egotism and self-conceit and false self-preservation that says, if I get that person or leave that person, I will feel more secure. So you choose on the basis of false self-protection and self-security, which is all wrong. You know, you see, if I go to this new employment over there, I'll get twice as much money and I'll feel much more secure. No, you won't. The only way to be authentically secure is to see through your egotism so that you no listen, listen to the beauty of this, so that you no longer have to choose anything. 
outside of whether you want white or whole wheat bread down at the market. See, now, an egotist always has to choose because he's scared. He always has to choose the thing that's going to keep his egotism in place. And he's afraid he's going to make the wrong choice. As long as you don't so see through your, your sickness, you'll always be in this torment. How many of you live in torment? Every one of you raise your hand. Every one of you. You've learned how to be free tonight. We'll take one more, then go home. The lady over there. Say that again. If there's any kind of pain or nervous, nervousness inside me, it must be wrong. That is absolutely right now. Can all of you here, before we leave, look at your behavior in this room and see where something in you was fighting the truth? What is fighting the truth? I am telling you, and I don't care whether you take it or not. It's up to you. I'm responsible for me, not for you. If you're fight, fighting the pure, decent truth that you're hearing here tonight, if you're fighting it, guess what you're fighting for? Your own misery and destruction. Good night. A man was driving across country on business and he drove on and on and on and on and finally entered a little town, the population, 5,000. And as he drove in, he said, ah, fine place to stop for lunch. So he stopped, pulled the car over, looked around for a cafe. But the minute he pulled the car to a stop, his mind was taken over by something other than lunch. Because he looked around People were walking up and down the street, and they were sitting in front of their homes. Wherever he looked, there were people, and what they were doing was sobbing. Everyone he saw was crying, dabbing their eyes with their little handkerchiefs, wailing away. He says, what's this? So he stopped, a man came down the street and said, what, uh, what's going on here? I'm a stranger here. Can you explain what? What's going on here? I drive in and I see everybody bawling. He said, oh, that's simple. This is called crybaby land. <coughs> crybaby land. Yeah, and the stranger, the uh, man explained to the driver, the tourist, everybody here in town spends all their time bawling, crying. That's all they do. This is their daily occupation. The, the tourist couldn't understand it because where he came from, people didn't just sit around and cry and make it their daily occupation. So I said, uh, I'll have to look into this. Well, how interesting. All they do is ball, going around bawling. I'm talking about you. All you do is ball. Let's get out of the story for me. I'm talking to an audience here. Those of you listening to this tape, cassette tape, I'm talking to an audience here of about maybe 80, 90, 100 people. And I'm talking to you listening to this tape as well as to this live audience because I know that you you cry too but on with the story so I said I'm gonna investigate this what's what's going on here so he wandered around and he one of the things he discovered is that the it wasn't the movie theaters or the cafes that were the most popular places in town what was the most popular was handkerchief shops <laughs> Tremendous business, going that people going in and out all day and night long buying handkerchiefs to dab their pretty blue eyes, wet eyes. So he investigated some more. And listen to what he found as you get the parallel with your life, your life. This is not going to be very pleasant. He found out that all the people of crybaby land not only were weepers and howlers and sobbers and depressed and wet-eyed people, he found out that along with crying came another human characteristic. And here is what it was, what it is. He found out that weepers are very, very unpleasant people to be around. 
Did you, did you ever think of yourself as being unpleasant? Probably not, but I am telling you that you are. Do you present a pleasant appearance with your semi-wet eyes all the time? With your emotionalism? Look, look what he found out. He found out that everybody being crybabies, grown-up crybabies, bawling all the time. He found out that it had become so natural, in quote marks, so naturally unnatural that nobody ever thought of each other as being unpleasant. It was accepted as being normal. To be depressed, to tr throw your trash with your eyes, with your facial expression, with your manner, to throw your trash onto someone else. Isn't that very bad manners? Isn't that unpleasant? I'll make it stronger. Some of you people with your precious self-images of being a nice, pleasant, independent human being. I'll go stronger than that. And, and there's a, a very profound psychological meaning behind it, a spiritual law, as a matter of fact. Not only were the crybabies of crybaby land unpleasant, they were repulsive. Let me tell you, if you associate with crybabies, you're one of them. That's your level. This is what you like. This is what you want. And you never see it any more than any of you here see your depression. Any more than you see your depression and then you don't have the intelligence or the goodness or the sanity enough to call it all wrong.